Thank you very much for the introduction, Martin. Um, look, it's always great to be back at the RI. Uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I can't be there in person. So as Martin mentioned, I'm speaking to you from Sydney, Australia, where it's just gone six o'clock in the morning and the sun is rising. Um, every so often, I'm going to be taking a sip of coffee just to be waking up here. Um, I still hope that I can make this an entertaining and at least uh, you know, useful evening for you to understand about the quantum and the cosmos. So. Some of you would have been to my talks at the RI before, um, but for those who haven't, just a little introduction. Again, as Martin mentioned, I, um, I'm a, a, a researcher at the University of Sydney. I study the dark side of the universe, and I use various techniques to try and tell us about the dark matter and the dark energy that shape the cosmos. As well as being a, a researcher, I'm also a teacher, and I'm also very passionate about um, outreach, and I give lots of public talks each year. And um, actually, I should have updated my bio because the reason why I'm here tonight is that not that I've published two books, but I've recently published a third book on sort of mysteries of the universe. So the first book I published up there called A Fortunate Universe, I spoke at that, about that at the RI in 2017. But what I want to talk about tonight is the, the topic of my most recent book, Where Did the Universe Come From and Other Cosmic Questions? So my co-author on this book is uh, Chris Ferry. He is a, an associate professor at the University of Technology in Sydney, and he's a quantum physicist. So his focus of research is the world of the very small, right? He's very interested in things like quantum computing and quantum information. Whereas my research area is the very large, right? It's everything that's out there, the entire universe. So what I want to get over tonight is the reason why we got together and wrote this book about quantum mechanics and cosmology and why we need both of those to understand the way that the universe works. I think a good starting point is going to be this excellent map of physics that was drawn by uh, Dominic Wallerman a couple of years ago. So this is sort of like a historical guide to how we've come to understand the universe. So we can take a look at this picture and we can travel from left to right. And basically, this is the development through time of modern physics. We start at the far left-hand side at the time of people like Galileo and, and Isaac Newton, and the realization that we could write down laws of the universe, and not just write them down in words, but write them down in mathematics. That became the powerful thing that we could do to make predictions about the way the universe works. Of course, Isaac Newton is one of the greatest scientists ever, and he gave us classical mechanics, the, the way that forces uh, act on bodies, and he also uncovered the way that gravity works. So he was one of the first that was able to write down the fact that if you want to calculate how a planet orbits the sun or how an apple falls from the tree, you can use the same mathematics to do that. We move on into the future, especially into the 19th century, and there was a great advance again in our scientific understanding. Uh, one of the giants at this time was James Clerk Maxwell, who, who realized these two very seemingly different topics, electricity on one hand, and magnetism on the other could be united together into this single field we now call electromagnetism. And it's within his equations that we discover that light is an electromagnetic wave. Also at this time, there was a, a great interest in how things like steam engines work, right? We, this was uh, you know, during the industrial revolution and people were very interested in questions of efficiency. How do I turn steam into motion? And the entire field of thermodynamics, which is the study of heat grew out of um, that particular topic, and it remains one of the giants of modern physics. Up until about 1900, things sort of made sense, right? We had this understanding of the universe where things were, you know, to do with pushes and pulls and electricity and magnetism and heat and cold. But as we moved into the 20th century, things started to get turned slightly on its head. When we look at the, the, the center of this picture at the top, we can see Albert Einstein, who of course needs no introduction as one of the greatest scientists of, the, of, of any time, really. And working in the early 1900s, he basically uh, rocked the world by showing that our notions of time and space, the ideas that had been laid out by Newton, were incorrect. He showed that time and space were more malleable things, things that you could interchange between one and the other. And so he came up with this revolutionary theory of uh, special relativity, which showed that if you're traveling at um, relative velocities to one another, time actually ticks differently. 
So it, it seems very weird and seems very esoteric kind of thing. But again, what he showed in his theory is that um, that this is how we really need to understand the universe is by time being a more slippery thing than we understood from the time of Newton. On the bottom of this picture was the, the parallel development. In the early years of the, the 1900s, uh, people started to really examine the world of the very small. They wanted to understand essentially at how atoms work and how atoms join together to form molecules. And what was realized is that if you wanted to describe the action of an atom, you can't use the laws of physics as laid out by Isaac Newton. So we know that atoms are crea uh, created by a big bunch of positive charge in the nucleus. We have a negative charge, which is the electrons, which orbit. And you might think, well, how, can I describe that orbit in the same way that Newton talks about the orbits of a planet? And it was found that all of that breaks down and you need a completely new set of mathematics to describe the world of the very small. And this is the notion of quantum physics. And quantum physics is very unlike our day-to-day -day experience, right? It, it is not the same kind of stuff that happens to us when we basically walk through doors and just move around, et cetera. There are very different kinds of physical things going on. And whilst it seems to go against our common sense, it is a remarkably accurate theory. You can make predictions in quantum mechanics for the measurements of particular objects, and they will be accurate to 12 decimal places. So, you know, it turns out that the, the world of the very small, the world of the quantum is, is highly successful, but just very, very weird. As um, quantum physics was being developed on one hand, Einstein hadn't finished with his theory of relativity. He realized that his special theory of relativity missed out an important ingredient in the universe, and that ingredient was gravity. And he worked for another 10 years from 1905 to 1915 to show that if you want to talk about gravity in terms of the modern way we understand it, you've got to get rid of this notion that uh, Newton had that gravity is a force, and instead you talk about the curvature and bending of space time. So he came up with this, his general theory of relativity, which we now use as our, our theory of gravity. Um, and we talk about gravity in terms of warped and bent space. So we have quantum mechanics on one hand, we have relativity on the other. And you'll see that as we move towards the right to this figure, Dominic has drawn in what he calls the chasm of ignorance, right? And part of this is to remind us that, that physics is not done, right? Back in 1900, people kept saying things like, oh, no, we're approaching the end of physics. We understand that we're, we're still not there. There's still a lot to learn. But you'll notice the chasm of ignorance stretches back between the description of the world in terms of quantum mechanics and the description of the world in terms of general relativity. And they turn out being, uh, to be two very different theories. And that's going to be sort of what I want to get across tonight is why they're different and why we need them to work together. So let's just take a look at what the differences are here, why we say that these are different theories. So let's start with relativity and gravitation. As we uh, mentioned, when we were in the times of Newton and we wanted to talk about gravity, we spoke about gravity as being the force between two objects. You have two objects, they have mass, and because of that mass, there's a force that draws them together. Einstein, when he re rewrote the laws of Newton, he got rid of the notion of gravity actually being a force as we imagine it in terms of a push or a pull. Instead, he wrote down a new set of equations. I'm going to put up the equations because I think these are very beautiful equations. If you don't like equations, you can ignore them. But these are the equations that Einstein wrote down to tell us how we should describe gravity. And I, he took away the notion of the force and he put instead this notion that space and time are curved and bent and gravity comes from this curvature and bending of space time. And it seems very weird, right? I mean, a force seems very natural. You can push on something, you can pull on something, but to think about space and time being curved is a very weird idea. But the thing is, is that, is that it works, right? This notion works. And you know it works because when you take out your phone and you, you know, go into Google Maps and you type in, how do I get to a certain place? That relies on things like the GPS system. And the GPS system is completely dependent on the notion of curved and warped space-time to make it work. On the other side, we have quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics is responsible for the three other fundamental forces in the universe. So there are four forces in total we need to worry about. 
gravity on one side and the three others on, on the quantum mechanical side. The one in the middle is the one that you're probably most familiar with. That's electromagnetism. So that's to do with charges and currents and the reason why your magnet sticks to the fridge door. The two other forces are a, a little bit strange, but we don't really see them on a day-to-day -day basis because they really only occur with inside the nucleus of an atom. So one of them is the strong force. And as the name suggests, it's a strong force and it's responsible for binding together the nuclei of your atoms. The other is the weak force, which is responsible for um, an aspect of radioactive decay, right? So uh, when you get uh, a particular decay, beta decay, that is from one of the fundamental forces in the universe, okay? Now, when we wanted to describe these forces, right, we use the laws of quantum mechanics. We use the language of quantum mechanics. And the language of quantum mechanics is very different to the language of relativity. If, you, if you've ever done a course in quantum mechanics, you know you don't talk about curved and warped space-time, but you talk about this weird thing called the wave function. And the wave function tells you not you know, basically where an object is and what it's doing, but it talks about probabilities. How likely is it that something is somewhere rather than somewhere else? And it leads to lots of strange discussions, such as the famous one to do with um, Schrodinger's cat, which is apparently alive and dead at the same time. So a very, very different mathematical language. But if I take those laws of quantum mechanics, I can basically work out the actions of all of these, these forces, strong, electromagnetic, and weak. And at the bottom of the picture here, we, we have, again, one of the great successes of uh, 20, 20th century physics. This is what's known as the standard model of particle physics. So this includes all of the things called quarks and leptons and the bosons, including the most famous one, the Higgs boson. And what this picture really represents is a mathematical framework that allows me to calculate how the strong force, the electromagnetic force, and the weak force operate. So modern physics requires two textbooks, right? You need a textbook on one side to tell you about relativity and gravity, and you need a textbook on the other side to tell you about the other fundamental forces. And they're very, very different textbooks. They talk about very, very different things. And this makes physicists very angry because, you know, at heart, physicists are lazy people and we would prefer just one textbook with one set of mathematics that could describe all of the fundamental forces. But at the moment, we just have this um, situation where we need two. Now, most of the time, we don't really worry about this. It is one of those things that people are working on to try and unite the two. But most of the time, as a practicing physicist, you don't have to worry about this distinction. And I can illustrate that with a very simple example. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take two protons. Now remember, a proton is one of the particles inside the nucleus of your atom, okay? You have two particles inside there. You have the proton, which carries a positive charge, and a neutron, which has no charge. They're very small little particles. They have a tiny amount of mass, and they have a tiny amount of charge. Now, if I take two protons, and I put them near each other, I can calculate the forces that are acting. So the two forces that I need to think about, one of them is gravity. So these two little particles, they've got mass. And because they have mass, there's a gravitational attraction between them. So that, you know, gravity is trying to pull them together. They also carry charge. So I can also calculate how much force that is due to electromagnetism. So I've got my equation, so I can calculate my gravitational force and I can calculate my electromagnetic force. And because they have the same charge, the electromagnetic force is trying to push them apart. So when I try and take uh, the, uh, the, the ratio of these two forces to find out which is the, the dominant one, I do the calculation. And what I find is that if I calculate the ratio of the force of gravity to the force of electromagnetism, the answer is this number 10 to the power of minus 40. Now, just a reminder, this is a, a scientific notation way of us writing out numbers. What this means is if it's 10 to the power of minus 40, it's going to be 0 0.0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 39 zeros and a 1. So what it tells us is in this particular situation, if I have two protons, then I can basically neg neglect the force of gravity. The only thing that really matters in my calculation is the electromagnetic repulsion. The gravity does nothing.
So if I was working with two protons, I wouldn't even bother calculating, calculating the gravitational force. I would just work with electromagnetism. And in fact, if I take all of the fundamental forces and I calculate their relative strengths, so I go through and I can work out the various situations where I worry about these forces. So the, I'll take the strong forces being you know, one. So that's what I'm comparing everything to. Electromagnetism is about one one hundredth the strength of the strong force. OK, so, no, it's it's smaller, um, but, you know, it's still a relatively strong force. The weak force is about a millionth the strength of the strong force. OK, so again, it's a it, it's, it's a weaker force, as, as the name suggests. But you can sort of see that, you know, you could work out you know, a millionth. Maybe uh, I could neglect this force or maybe it plays an important role. Gravity, though, there's a huge gap between gravity and the other forces. It's relative strength 10 to the minus 38, which means that normally when you have in a situation where you worry about the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, you can ignore gravity. The only time that gravity really plays a role is when you've got enough mass there to overwhelm the other forces. So if I'm sitting, you know, take a particular situation, me sitting here in this room, I want to calculate the forces really acting on me at the moment. I have to worry about the gravitational force because the Earth is below me and there's so much mass that the weakness of gravity is compensated by the total amount of mass and becomes an appreciable force. But for most of physics, as I said, you can cleanly cut it between do I worry about the strong electromagnetic and weak force or do I worry about gravity? So just to give you some examples, right? Um, if you're going to be looking at plane flight or interplanetary travel or even interstellar and intergalactic travel, you want to travel through the universe, you only need to worry about the force of gravity, right? Your rocket, when it's taken off, all you worry about is its interaction with the mass of the Earth because that's the dominant force on the rocket. I've already mentioned GPS, the global positioning system. That relies on the fact that you know, these satellites are moving at high speed in a different gravitational pull to us here on the surface of the Earth. And so I need to worry about Einstein's general theory of relativity, the gravitation involved, and I can ignore the other forces. And in this picture here, I've got one of my colleagues. This is Tim Bedin, also at the Sydney Institute for Astronomy, with his now ex-student, Isabella Coleman, and they're planet hunters. So they go looking for extra, extra solar planets out there in the universe. And when they find one of these extrasolar planets, they want to know how big it is, how quickly it's orbiting, et cetera. The only force that they need to worry about is the gravitational attraction between the star and the planet. And that will reveal all of the secrets. On the flip side, there are situations where we only need to worry about quantum mechanics. So if you are a nuclear engineer and you're running a, a nuclear plant and you want to calculate how much energy is that plant going to release. Now, inside a nuclear reactor, you've got the nuclear of atoms. You've got things flying around, high energy neutrons crash into things. You have the strong force, electromagnetism, etc. You don't need to include the force of gravity in your calculations to work out how much energy your nuclear reactor is going to produce, right? It's completely irrelevant. Now, the engineer that builds the power plant, they need to think about gravity, right? How much concrete do you need? But, you know, for calculating the efficiency of uh, your nuclear power plant, it's the nuclear reactions, ignore gravity. Similarly, particle physics, if I was at, at CERN, um, you're accelerating particles to, you know, almost the speed of light and you're crashing them together. And in those crashes, right, that's basically the fundamental forces at work. And what comes out is due to the strong force, the weak force and electromagnetism. And you can ignore the effect of gravity when you calculate the reactions that are going on at CERN. And in this lower picture, there's a, another one of my colleagues, David Riley, and he's one of the many around the world trying to build a quantum computer, right? So in a quantum computer, you're taking particles, you're putting them in, into magnetic fields, and you're trying to get qubits and do all this kind of stuff. And one of the things that he can ignore in his experiments, one of the only things he can really ignore, is the action of gravity. He has to worry about you know, interference from electromagnetism and the, the, the weak force where you get radioactive decays but you don't need to worry about what gravity is doing, right? The other forces dominate. And in fact, this is the way that we teach these topics, right? I've recently finished teaching uh, general relativity and cosmology to our honors group 
in, uh, at the University of Sydney. And in that course, they heard about curved and warped space times, but they didn't hear about any of the other fundamental forces. At the same time, they had parallel lectures on quantum field theory, which is modern quantum mechanics. And in there, they do discuss the, those other forces, strong, weak, and electromagnetic, but they didn't talk about gravity. And so we have these really distinct topics that taught in a very distinct fashion, and they, they quite happily stay apart for most of the time. But there's one particular situation where we can't ignore the effects of basically gravity on one hand and quantum mechanics on the other. And that turns out to be the universe at large, right? So this was the reason why Chris and I got together to, to write this book, is because we wanted to show that whilst gravity and quantum mechanics are often presented as two distinct and separate things. If you want to understand how the universe works, you need to get them to work together. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna run through a few examples about, about how we make quantum mechanics and, and gravity work together and what the implications of this particular situation is. And I'm gonna go through the, a little bit through the history of the universe. I'm gonna look back through the universe, present day and into the future and talk about gravity and quantum mechanics working together. I'm gonna to start almost precisely 100 years ago, right? So 1915, Einstein gave us his general theory of relativity, his new picture of gravity. And one of the things that he wanted to do was to describe the evolution of the universe in terms of his new equations. Now, it, it was a bit of a, a, a stop-start kind of situation about deciding exactly how the universe behaved. And there were two other key players at the time. One of them is Alexander Friedman up there, who is a, a Russian physicist. And uh, Georges Lemaitre in the bottom here was a Belgian cleric who basically worked and developed in what we now call basically modern cosmology. How do we understand the universe in terms of the mathematics that Einstein wrote down? Now, what they derived, and again, sorry if you have an equation phobia, but I'm going to pop up again what I think is another beautiful equation. They, they derived an, an equation here that tells you how the universe behaves. How does the universe expand? How does it change with time? Remember up to this point, people had thought that the universe was static and unchanging, but what Einstein had ultimately shown is that the universe is a dynamic and changing place. And as scientists, we want to know just how does that change occur? Now, again, you don't have to worry about the, the details of this equation, but there are two pieces to it. On one side, we have the acceleration of the universe, right? So, as I said, we, we know that the universe is expanding. We know that objects are getting further and further apart. And so what this left-hand side of the equation does is tells you how fast that expansion is occurring. Okay, So it's an acceleration. On the right-hand side, we tell you that, that, that this tells you that that expansion depends upon the stuff in the universe. And what I mean by that is that if you've got a universe and it's filled with, say, matter, that matter acts as a break on the expansion. So if you've got matter in the universe, it slows down the expansion. And this, this expression tells you just how much the matter slows the expansion. But what we realize here is that then there is a sort of relationship between the two. There's almost a feedback loop, and I can draw it as a, as a sort of feedback loop, okay? So what we've got is that our cosmic expansion, the way the universe expands, depends upon the stuff in the universe. And it doesn't just depend upon the stuff that's there, but the properties of the stuff. How dense is it? How hot is it? You know, is it radiation or is it matter? And those are things that are all set by quantum mechanics, right? It's quantum mechanics that governs all of those sort of internal relationships. But the stuff in the matter then tells the universe how to expand. So if you imagine that you've got a universe that's filled with just matter, as the universe expands, that matter thins out and its density becomes lower and lower. But as that density drops, that tells the universe how to expand, which tells the matter how quickly it's going to thin out as the, as the universe gets larger and larger. So there's a feedback loop here between relativity on one hand and quantum mechanics on the other. And we can piece these two together. We can use relativity to talk about the expansion and quantum mechanics to talk about the stuff of the universe and its properties. And what we've been able to do, of course, 
is over the last 100 years, we've been able to, get a, to put together the history of the universe. So this now is a, a summary of how we think the universe has behaved over the last 13.8 billion years. So you can see written in there is the age of the universe. It's a very non-linear scale. It goes from tiny fractions of the second on the left-hand side to billions of years on the right-hand side. Um, on the top and the bottom, I've added some extra information. I've, at the top, I've put temperature. And again, we've used our scientific notation. So 10 to the 25 means one followed by 25 zeros. So that's the temperature in Kelvin. Today, the universe is cold. It's 2.75 degrees Kelvin, which means it's 2.75 degrees above absolute zero. The universe is a cold place. But as we go back in time, when the universe was smaller, more compressed, it was hotter, we can see that the temperature goes up and up and up. Now, remember that the surface of the sun is around 6,000 degrees. The center of the sun is a few tens of millions of degrees. But we can see here that the temperature of the universe, if we go back far enough, are temperatures that we just basically never experience here on Earth. On the bottom, we've got the density of the universe. And the universe today is, is a, has an average density of 10 to the minus 31 grams per centimeter cubed, right? That's really a couple of hydrogen atoms per cubic meter. That's the average density of the universe. Again, as we go back in time, the universe was smaller, more compressed. And so the density of the universe gets higher and higher. At about three minutes, when the universe was about a billion degrees Kelvin, the density of the universe was around 10 grams per centimeter cubed, which is the density of water. So we can sort of understand that density. But as we push back further and further, what we find is the density gets higher and higher and higher. What we can see is that across this uh, history of the universe, when there were different densities and temperatures, there were different kinds of physics occurring, okay? So what we have, of course, is what, when the temperature of the universe is like the temperature of the center of the sun, you expect the kind of physics in the universe to be like the physics you find in the center of the sun, which is nuclear reactions. If we push back even further where densities and temperatures are even higher, instead of nuclear reactions, you get particle interactions, the kind of things that you get the Large Hadron Collider. You push back even further, you get into the realms of physics, which we, we can't even test here on Earth, but we think we have the equations to explain. Now, remember, of course, this is all part of that feedback loop, right? The physics in the universe, is it nuclear physics? That's telling you what the matter is doing, is telling the universe how to expand. That expansion is telling the material how to cool. Is it still behaving as nuclear material or is it cooled down to atomic material, et cetera? So we can take a look at basically how the um, expansion of the universe, which is relativity, and how quantum mechanics have shaped the universe around us. So what we've got is something that occurred in the first few minutes of the universe. And it's, its name, you know, the official name is Big Bang Nucleosynthesis, but it's really the formation of the first few chemical elements. And again, if we just think about the, the picture that we've got there, we're going to start at around 10 seconds. So the universe is 10 seconds old, which for the universe, it's already you know, changed a lot in that period of time. But at this time, the universe was around 10 billion degrees Kelvin. Okay, It was approaching that density of water, but it was a very high energy place. So the universe contained protons and neutrons. So those, again, are the particles that make up the nuclei of your atom but it was so hot that those particles couldn't join together. So you can imagine these things are buzzing around, right? They're bouncing off each other. Every so often they latch onto each other using the strong force, but there's high energy radiation in there as well, which comes along, collides with it and rips it apart. So at about 10 seconds, the universe was too hot for anything other than individual protons and individual neutrons. We get to about 100 seconds, so the universe has expanded, the universe has cooled, the temperature has now dropped to about a billion degrees Kelvin, so quite balmy, and things are now starting to be able to latch together. So protons and neutrons are able to join together, and the collisions are becoming less violent. So when they start to join, they're able to hold on to each other. When we get to around a thousand seconds, the universe has expanded and cooled some more. And 
again, things have joined together, collisions have become far less violent. And now what we can see as well as the, the protons in the universe, we have some uh, other atomic nuclei, and we can see that there are nuclei in here of helium, which is the second most abundant element in the universe. So this is sort of the stages that the universe, is, universe goes through, but we want to sort of understand this in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to turn you into um, cosmologists and nuclear physicists by trying to understand the reactions that are going on here. So we'll go back to those early stages, right? This is when the universe was very hot. Things were colliding together. And in fact, the collisions were so violent, right, that protons and neutrons were changing their identity. So protons would turn into neutrons, neutrons would turn into protons, etc. Collisions would be occurring. Eventually, the universe cools down that you get these individual protons and individual neutrons. So the universe is now running against a clock because the neutron is a slightly weird particle. The neutron, if you leave it alone for around 50 minutes, decays into a proton. So from this moment on, the number of these free neutrons in the universe is starting to decline. And we'll see that they play an important role in forming the matter from which we're made. As the universe cools, a proton can join with a neutron, and that creates something called a deuteron. This is the nucleus of deuterium or heavy hydrogen. So it's just a proton and neutron joined together. Similarly, a neutron can join with a proton, and that can also produce deuterium. Now remember, the, the clock is running, the number of neutrons is steadily decreasing as they decay. Uh, a neutron can join then with deuterium, and that creates a triton, which is the nucleus of tritium, which is very heavy hydrogen. Or you can add another proton, and you can make the nucleus of helium-3, right? So we're starting to get into heavier elements. But adding a proton to a deuteron is hard to do. Why? Because both carry positive charge. So they repel each other. And so they actually make it harder for the deuteron to become helium-3 because there's this extra repulsion. Again, we can add a neutron and that will make helium-4 or a proton again, and that will make uh, helium-4. But again, that reaction at the top is becoming harder because what we have got is two positive charges repelling each other, which makes the making of the helium-4 more difficult. Now, we can keep playing this game. We can add more protons and neutrons, and we can take into account the fact the number of neutrons is changing. We can take into account that it gets harder and harder to push things together when they've got more and more charge. And what you end up with is... Um, this kind of picture here, this is what, what we call a reaction network. So you can see that that sort of just, um, little schematic that we put on the left-hand side, that's in the bottom left of this figure, where we go from protons and neutrons up to helium-4. But you can see that there's pathways to other elements, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon. But these reactions are becoming harder and harder because we're losing the neutrons and positively charged things repel each other and the universe is cooling down, etc. So how do we understand what comes out of the Big Bang? Well, you know, being um, physicists, we, uh, we can go through and we can calculate the rates of all of these reactions, right? They're quantum mechanical reactions, so we can work out how likely it is for one thing to turn into another in a collision. And we can write that out in the mathematics. And again, as physicists are lazy people, we don't actually solve these equations ourselves. What we do is we write them into computer code and get the computer to solve them for us. So I'm just gonna uh, give you a little example of, of what kind of happens here. So this is the result of a little computer program. You can get the computer program yourself and run this yourself if you, if you wanna generate your own universes. I've put the link into, into the, the slide here. We're gonna go from left to right. And we're going to go through time through the first few moments of the universe. So time is going to be written across the top. Again, it's not a linear time. So you'll see it, it'll be one second, 10 seconds, 100 seconds, 1,000 seconds, etc. On the bottom will be temperature. So we'll see that the universe will be cooling down as it expands. And we'll see colored lines. And those colored lines are going to be the abundance of protons and neutrons and helium and the other elements as we go through these first few minutes. So here we go. We start off 
the orange and the blue, that's the protons and neutrons. We can see that in the early universe, they were the only things that were there. We get to this time at around 100 seconds where the universe is cooled down enough to allow things to start to join together. And then between like 100 and 1,000 seconds, lots of uh, reactions go on. And we can see that um, the universe makes a lot of helium. It also makes some lithium. But by 1,000 seconds, the universe has cooled down to such a point that the reactions that you need to basically join things together has, has basically gone so poor that you can no longer create heavier elements. So after the first three minutes, our universe was 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, and traces of uh, lithium and other elements. And all of this was shaped by the interplay between the expansion of the universe, which is gravity, and the quantum mechanics of the stuff in the universe. After that point, right, a universe was essentially a smooth soup of hydrogen and helium. And of course, it would have stayed that way, right? Because none of the forces, electromagnetism, strong force and weak force, can operate on large scales, right? The universe is overall neutral, so there's no big electromagnetic forces. But of course, what we've got in the universe is gravity. And this is a, a result of a, a simulation that was generated by a group in Europe, the illustrious group. So this is meant to be a large chunk of the universe. And this is now a few billion years after the Big Bang. And what actually happens, of course, is gravity starts to pull matter together, right? So where you've got regions which are slightly more dense, that pulls in matter around it. And you get gas coming together, collapsing down, and forming the first stars. Now, this is a large chunk of the universe. Our Milky Way galaxy would, would be just one of these little faint blue dots, which is just trundling around. We're looking at the evolution here of lots and lots of matter in the universe. But what you can see is that that matter was drawn together by gravity, but there's lots of other processes going on. We're starting to see explosions. These are the explosions of massive stars. So these are very, very important because these essentially carry on from where the Big Bang left off and forge the heavier elements from which we're made. So the, the next place in the universe that we need to worry about gravity and quantum mechanics are stars, okay? So, so stars are somewhat like the Big Bang. If you imagine that you know, we've got this big cloud of gas, which is hydrogen and helium, right? and gravity has drawn it together. So gravity is gonna pull on it and pull on it and start to squeeze it and squeeze it. That gas has some pressure in it, right? And that pressure can push outwards, but if there's enough there, gravity can keep squeezing and keep squeezing and keep squeezing. And you think that after a while, gravity would eventually win and squeeze this thing down to nothing. But we get to a point where the squeezing by gravity heats the gas, right? In the same way that, you know, you take a bike pump and you squeeze and the, the temperature of the gas in the bike pump gets higher. When you squeeze the core of this gas, the temperature soar, the density soar, and you finally get to a point where you get to the situation similar to the Big Bang, where you can squeeze things together such that you get nuclear reactions. Those nuclear reactions release energy and that energy produces a pressure as it, which pushes outwards. And so what you get is that an object like a star is a balancing act, right? Again, in the same way as the Big Bang, you've got a feedback loop. You've got gravity squeezing inwards, and you've got the push of energy from the nuclear forces pushing outwards. And for a stable star like our sun, they're in balance, okay? And for the sun, they're in balance for roughly 10 billion years. But when they get out of balance, then one of these forces is going to win. Either gravity is going to win and squeeze down even harder, or the outward push from the nuclear forces is going to win and essentially blow the star apart. But for most stars, right, it's a balance between radiation pushing outwards, gravity squeezing inwards for billions of years, which makes it possible for us to be here, right? So we need stars to exist for a long time. But it's there's some interesting things about what's going on in the heart of a star like the sun, okay? So let's just think about what's going on here. Now, our sun, right, is basically, right, it's got some helium in there, which we can ignore, but it's basically a big 
ball of protons, right? So again, the proton positive, positively charged particle in the nuclear of atoms. Remember, the neutrons only last for roughly 50 minutes. So by today, they're all gone, right? There's, there's no neutrons in the heart of the sun, um, which are just flying around. Now, if we think about the collapsing gas cloud that's going to become the sun, what's actually happening is that, that as gravity is squeezing the core, then you, you've got these protons and, and they're coming close and close together, but there's a very strong electromagnetic repulsion between them. So they can only get so close and then they push themselves apart again. So as the gravity squeezes and squeezes, protons get closer and closer together, but they don't get close enough for them to join together via the strong force. Eventually though, we get the sun squeezing so hard, right? The temperatures get up so high that the, the, the motions of the protons bring them close enough that they can overcome their electromagnetic repulsion and the strong force can catch hold of them. So the strong force, it can only operate over very short distances. It's like an arm that reaches out and grabs something. So you've got to get things close enough. But there's something weird about our universe is that you can't get two protons and get them to join together and stay together, right? When you look at the way the balance of the forces in, in the universe, two protons on their own will not stick together. You can take two protons and a neutron and they will stick together and they'll give you um, uh, the nucleus of helium-3, but two protons on their own just won't do it. So we've got the electromagnetic force, we've got the strong force, but we also need to bring the weak force into, a, uh, into play. So what happens is, again, in the sun, you get two protons come together, and very rarely, right, so once in a hundred trillion trillion times that protons crash together, there's a weak change in one of the protons. One of the protons can undergo one of these strange kind of radioactive changes, which changes it from a proton into a neutron, okay? And a proton and neutron will quite happily stick together. That's that uh, deuteron, the deuterium nucleus. And so that's the first step in stars being stars, right? Is that you, you can create deuterium. Now, it's really weird that we need these, these three things going on, electromagnetism, strong force, and weak force. The weak force occurs so rarely that this becomes a bottleneck in the sun burning its energy. And it turns out that, you know, pound for pound, the sun is a less efficient source of energy than a compost heap. Compost produces more energy per, for, for every kilo than the sun does, because this rare, we need this rare um, uh, event, this transformation of the weak force to allow us to produce the first element beyond um, raw hydrogen. Once it's done that, things become relatively relatively easy, I should point out. So this, at the top there, you can see you've got the two red ones, those are two protons. We go through the first stage, we produce deuterium, the squeezing continues, you can make helium. And if you've got sufficient squeezing, you can produce heavier elements. So for very light stars, where gravity isn't very strong, they basically stop at the first stage, right? they can produce some of the lightest elements. Stars like the sun, which can have a medium amount of squeezing, that can produce some of the heavier elements. But if we want to produce really heavy elements, right? Elements up to iron, you need a lot of squeezing because you need to force together very, very positively charged nuclei. And to do that, you need massive stars. So if we take a look at um, a, a massive star, right? So this is the inside of a giant star. So this might be 10 times the mass of the sun, if not more, okay? So what we've got, remember this star started off as a, a ball of, of hydrogen, just like our sun. But what happens is because of the squeezing that's going on, gravity can force the temperatures and densities to such high numbers that you get hydrogen converted into helium, helium into carbon, carbon into neon, neon into oxygen, oxygen into silicon, and then silicon ultimately into iron. 
Now, of course, carbon is very important for us because it's what we're made of. And oxygen is very important to us because it's what we breathe. And iron is very important for us because it's the basis of steel, which is you know, the modern world. And so these elements are created within this, this structure of these massive stars. But these elements are no good to us if they're inside the star. What we need them is on planets. So we need a mechanism to get them from inside the star out into the universe. And what we see is that uh, written in here are the timescales for how long these stars spend doing this kind of burning, as it's called. So the hydrogen burning, the star lasts for about seven million years. Then it switches to helium burning about half a million years. Carbon burning, 600 years. Neon burning, one year. Oxygen burning, six months. And when it gets to the stage that it's burning silicon into iron, that lasts for one day. And once it's gotten to the iron, then bad things happen for the star. In all of the nuclear reactions up to iron, then um, they release energy and that energy pushes outwards and supports the star. But if you want to turn iron into elements heavier than iron, into gold, etc., then they suck in energy. They don't release energy. So at this particular point, the, the nuclear reactors at the heart of the star are going to end and the, the star is going to die. What happens? So this is where we need to worry about the deaths of stars. Okay. So as I mentioned, if you've got a small star, something like a red dwarf, that can burn hydrogen into helium. But red dwarfs, they, they, they burn for a long time. They're really boring. They basically just switch themselves off. So any elements they produce are locked away and hidden at the heart of the star. For a star like our sun, right? It's going to be stable for about 10 billion years. And then it will go through sort of some weird changes as it burns uh, helium into heavier elements. But eventually it becomes unstable. That feedback loop breaks down and it becomes one of these beautiful things, which is called a planetary nebula. And it will blow off its outer layers. And so in blowing off the outer layers, then some of those elements it created get recycled into the gas in the universe and go into the next generation of, of stars and planets. But what we're interested in is what happens to the massive stars, the massive stars which have got cores of iron, etc. And as I mentioned, what you've got is you get to this point where they've produced iron in the core, the nuclear reactions turn off, and so there's no longer a flow of energy, so gravity starts to win. Gravity takes the outer layers of this star and crashes it down onto the core. That crashing down of the core results in something known as a supernova, which blows the star apart. So what actually happens when the core of this giant star gets crushed? The, the temperatures and densities just go off the scale again. They're numbers that we're not used to here on Earth. What, what happens is, firstly, if you look at the top panel there, is that electrons which are flying around get pushed into protons, okay? So they get forced together and those become neutrons. So the forces are so intense that the electrons get squeezed into the, the protons. So you end up with a, this huge sea of neutrons and heavy elements. They all get crushed together. And so even though the star itself couldn't produce um, heavier elements when it was just normally burning, in a supernova, you sort of supercharge the nuclear reactions, you put in lots of energy from the collapse of the star, and you produce lots and lots of heavier elements. But they're all still stuck inside the star. What actually causes the star to rip itself apart? And the thing that does that is the blue little wiggly line we can see in the top of the panel there. That blue little wiggly line is a particle called a neutrino, which is one of the most feeble particles in the universe. Right? They don't bother interacting with anything. Right? There, there are trillions of them streaming through you right now, coming from the core of the sun. In fact, they can travel through like a light year of lead before there's a chance of them interacting with anything. Right? They are feeble, feeble particles. But when you crush the, the core of the star, you convert so many protons into neutrons, you produce so many neutrinos that these feeble particles can actually rip the surface of the star apart. 
So this is meant to be a look inside a star as it's undergoing a supernova. You've produced so many neutrinos that they fly outwards. They hit the outer layers of the star. They rip the outer layers off. The star explodes. And you produce something that's called a supernova. So in the, in the panel in the bottom corner here, we've got a picture of a spiral galaxy. So if we could step outside our Milky Way galaxy and look back, this is what we would see. In this picture, there's roughly two to 300 billion stars, but your eye is drawn to a single star in the bottom left-hand corner. That is a single star exploding, that's a supernova. And for a period of around two to three weeks, that single exploding star outshines the hundreds of billions of other stars in that galaxy. That's how much energy is released when these neutrinos rip the star apart. In ripping the star apart, those elements get spread out, get recycled into the next generation of stars. And what we can do is we can take a look at our, this is our astronomer's view of the uh, periodic table, okay? So what we've got here are all of the various elements and um, they're color coded by, by where the elements are made. So hydrogen and helium created in the Big Bang. But if you look at the color coding, you can see that carbon and nitrogen the carbon and nitrogen in your body, right? That was made in stars like the sun that died. There's lots of blue there, which is the exploding massive stars. So that's the supernova that go off. They take material, uh, create the heavier elements. And in fact, when you look at uh, elements such as, as gold, you know, something that we find very precious, there are other violent events in the universe, merging neutron stars where gravity and quantum mechanics are playing their parts, which produce these, these very heavy materials. But again, it's this interplay between gravity and, um, uh, and the other forces that give us this particular periodic table of elements that we see around us in the universe. So what we've got, of course, is that we are, we're in this period now where stars are burning. And we've mentioned that uh, stars die and uh, that some stars will just fade out. Some stars like the, the sun will blow off its outer layers, become a particular star called a white dwarf. Massive stars will explode. Maybe their core will be left over, something which we now know as a neutron star. Maybe the core will be crushed out of existence into something that we now know as a black hole. But we can put all this physics together and we can chart out what we think of as the history of the universe. So um, this is from a really nice book that I like called The Five Ages of the Universe by Fred Adams and Greg Locking. This sort of charts out the, the, the main epochs of the universe, right? So we have time across the bottom there in, um, in years. Again, a very nonlinear scale. In the first part, we've got a primordial era, which is the Big Bang. We now find ourselves in the Stellariferous era. That's the period of the universe where stars can shine, right? So stars are shining, they're using up their elements, but stars aren't gonna shine in the universe forever. We're about 10 to the 12 um, years after the Big Bang. Stars gonna shine for about 10 to the 15 years. So we're you know, not even 1% of the way through the time that stars are gonna be burning in the universe, but eventually we're gonna get to the point where stars are going to cease shining. We then enter what's known as the degenerate era. And it's not degenerate in the sense that it's something to do with SOHO. It's degenerate in the sense that there are different kinds of laws of physics at play that control in the universe. Eventually that era will come to an end and we'll be finding ourselves in the black hole era. And after around 10 to the 100 years, we, the universe will enter this eternal darkness that will last forever. But in each of these stages, we do still need to worry about gravity and quantum mechanics. So, as I mentioned, um, we're going through this epoch now where stars are living their lives and they are, uh, uh, massive stars are exploding. Uh, stars like the sun will last for a few of tens of billions of years, but there won't be new stars like the sun created eventually. And all that will be left in the universe are these tiny little stars, these red dwarfs. These will burn for trillions of years and eventually there will just be one star left. And it will basically get to the end of its life. It'll be burning hydrogen into helium and trying to burn helium into other elements. And it's not going to be able to do it. 
It will have a brief respite when it can become a, becomes a blue dwarf, but eventually it's going to run out of nuclear reactions, okay? And the star is going to go out. So the nuclear forces that are pushing to support the star, they disappear. The star contracts. And all it becomes is this solid ball, which is cooling down. And it cools and it cools and it fades and it fades into the darkness. But there's a question here. Why, why doesn't gravity completely win? Right? Now, remember, when you have a, a gas or a material, it's got a temperature and that provides a pressure. Um, but as it cools down, it's losing energy. And so you would think that like an anaconda wrapped around a person, right? That every time the star loses some energy and so it loses some pressure, gravity is going to squeeze a bit more. And then the star is going to lose this energy. Star's going to squeeze, gravity is going to squeeze. Eventually, gravity is going to win and squeeze this thing down to nothing. So why, why don't dead stars collapse? Why don't they con collapse completely? What stops gravity from winning? And again, it's quantum mechanics that we need to worry about. Okay, so I'm going to put up another little equation, right? It's because of this thing called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is a, one of the weird things in quantum mechanics that we don't have in classical physics. So don't worry about the equation, right? But what it tells you essentially is, is that how well you know where something is, is related to how well you know how fast it's moving. Now, remember, quantum mechanics is a language of probabilities, right? So you can either say that I know some, where something is to a very high probability, or I'm not sure where it is, you know, to a relative low probability. When we squeeze gas together inside the star, so you can imagine these blue dots, they might be electrons, they might be neutrons. We squeeze them together. What we're actually saying is, is that we're saying where we know a particle is to a high degree, right? Because it's only got a little amount of room to rattle around in. Now, remember that rattling around, that's actually pressure. That's what's providing the supporting force. But as the star cools, then the room that um, a, a little uh, electron or neutron has to rattle around in gets smaller. So our delta x, you know, how uncertain are we about the location of the, the particle, that becomes smaller again, which means that our knowledge of how quickly it's moving becomes larger. And it becomes a limit, right? It essentially becomes a packing limit whereby we squeeze all this stuff together such that in classical physics, right, in terms of uh, what we know as classical thermodynamics, these particles would all have zero temperature. We would know exactly where they are. We would know that they're exactly still. But quantum mechanics says you can't do that. It says, right, you've nailed these particles down to be in these tiny little volumes, which means that their, their energies are actually a little bit all over the place. You don't really know what they do. So we end up with this thing called degeneracy pressure, which you only get from quantum mechanics. There's an extra pressure that occurs, which pushes outwards and stops gravity from winning. So this will mean that these dead stars won't completely collapse and they're going to exist in the universe for a long, long time. But they're not going to exist forever. OK, we don't think they're going to exist forever. Because what we, uh, we think is, again, we don't quite have the complete picture. But we worry about the proton. So, so this is our, our modern view of, of what a proton is made of. So we know that if we take a proton and, and look inside, we expect there to be three particles in there, three quarks, two up quarks and a down quark. And as far as you know, our current laws of physics tell us, our proton appears to be stable, that it should last for a long, long time. Except we know that there are, is a hole in our laws of quantum mechanics, which is, it's not guaranteed that it's there, but it suggests that a proton itself doesn't last forever. But there is another force in the universe, a fifth force, which is responsible for protons decay. Now, we haven't seen it. We've searched for it. But mathematically, it's, it's possible. And what would happen, it would mean that two of the, the quarks inside the uh, proton, they would basically join together to create the X boson, right? So um, we call it X because we're physicists and we're not very good at naming things. This thing decays and it becomes 
a positron and an anti-down quark. And what you get is that through this process, the proton will decay into other particles. What this means, of course, is that, you know, if you've got protons and you wait long enough, then they're going to decay. So matter is going to melt, right? Now, the time scale is huge. 10 to the 40 years, so that's one followed by 40 zero years. And on that scale, we expect matter to melt away. So quantum mechanics will should play a role on that. So these dead stars that exist in the universe, gravity is going to be trying to do its thing and squeeze it together, but the matter is going to be melting away until eventually they just sort of disintegrate into the background of the universe. All that will leave after that time are black holes, right? Now, black holes seem rather impervious, right? They, they, they are just representations of very strong gravity, okay? So they're described by uh, relativity. And so um, you'd think that once all the stars have melted away, then the black holes are gonna last forever. And you know, for a long time, people thought that until Stephen Hawking came along in the um, 1970s and said, no, you can't neglect quantum mechanics, even though these are structures in space-time. Because what's quant what uh, Stephen Hawking pointed out is that outside of the black hole is vacuum. There's nothing, right? So quantum mechanically though, empty space is not truly empty. So when we have the quantum vacuum, you've got the fact that you have probabilities that particles can exist. And there's always this low lying ripple in terms of uh, particles either popping in and out of existence. Now, um, you've probably heard various explanations of this thing that's called Hawking radiation. Most of them are really, really bad analogies. And the reason that we deal with the bad analogies is the actual description of what is going on is so sort of mind bending that um, we, we tend not to try and do it. But I'm gonna try and explain to you what's sort of going on here. So essentially when we've got the, the vacuum, right? We say we've got this fluctuating quantum stuff and this fluctuating quantum stuff, this is made of quantum waves, right? And these quantum waves are waves of particles, right? So things like the electron, there's a wave of the electron traveling forward in time. But we also have to worry about the waves of its antiparticle, the positron. And those particles waves, they travel backwards in time. I, and I know, I know, okay. But yeah, in quantum mechanics, things travel through time, forwards and backwards through time. And so these two waves encounter, and like it ripples on a pond, these ripples basically just give you a little sort of rippling of, of the water. But what we've got with a black hole, of course, is that we've got something that really screws up the way that time behaves, right? Black holes are one-way objects. You can fall into a black hole, but you can't get out. So if you've got these waves traveling backwards and forwards through time, then this black hole looks like it's a giant obstruction and it messes up this sort of mixing of the waves. And it turns these probabilities from this little fluctuating probabilities of virtual particles into big probabilities of real particles. So what you get is that the black hole basically disrupts the way quantum waves behave and turns virtual particles into real particles and they carry away radiation from the black hole. Okay, so radiation travels away and the black holes eventually evaporate. So what we're going to get is that um, on huge timescales of 10 to the 100 years, you're going to get that uh, black holes themselves, they're going to radiate away their mass, that mass gets turns into, into energy and disappears into the universe. Okay, so again, this is the ultimate interplay between quantum mechanics and gravity is that um, they, the black holes are eventually going to evaporate and disappear into the universe. I um, notice at the time here, I'm sorry, I do love talking about physics. I will I'll try and wrap up in the next few minutes to make sure that we've, um, we've got uh, time for questions. So quickly going to mention that um, what, what's the next step, right? What we want to do in physics is um, we want to close the, the chasm of ignorance, right? We want to close the chasm of ignorance because we know that there are 
uh, issues that we can't deal with yet because of the difference between quantum mechanics and relativity. I've spoken about the places where we think they work, but there are definite areas of the universe that we need to understand these theories better before we can get a full explanation. And there have been lots of suggestions about how you make quantum gravity, uh, make gravity and quantum mechanics work together. Supersymmetry is a, is a well-known one where you add new particles to the, the uh, quantum side of things, and that somehow will incorporate gravity. Loop quantum gravity is this notion that space and time are basically knitted out of the basic pieces of the universe that produce the particles. And of course, string theory, which has been around now for 40 years or so, um, which is trying to describe the actions of the universe in terms of these ultra fundamental things called strings, gravity should be incorporated in there somewhere. There's been a lot of effort in all of this. Einstein was working on trying to unite space time and electromagnetism on his deathbed in 1955. And we still don't know how close we are to closing the chasm of ignorance. But there are a couple of things that this is likely uh, to help solve. Um, one of them is why is there any matter in the universe? Okay. Now our universe, when it was born, it was probably born in a rather perfect symmetrical state. For every positron, there would have been an electron. For every up quark, there would have been an anti-up quark. And if the universe had evolved from that particular point, then all of these particles, once the universe cooled, would have annihilated, and that would leave no matter in the universe. So there's something else missing from our laws of physics that tells us that there has to be an asymmetry. And we can do the calculation that, you know, before the, um, the matter formed in the universe, that for every one billion positrons or one billion anti-up quarks or one billion anti-down quarks, there must have been a billion and one electrons and a billion and one up quarks and a billion and one down quarks. So when they annihilated, the annihilation wasn't complete and there was one electron left over, one up quark, one down quark, right, from each of the annihilations. And we don't know where this imbalance occurs, right? We think it's somewhere in the early universe. It might be when gravity and the other forces were of equal strength, and so they, they played off each other. But this is something that we came to understand because, of course, we need to understand this to understand why we're even here. The other question is about this other stuff, which I haven't really mentioned here, but it's this stuff called dark energy in the universe, right? And dark energy is, is a weird thing that's causing our universe to accelerate. When we look at the stuff of the universe, right? 5% of the universe is, is normal matter, is atoms, stuff like us. 25% is dark matter, but... The remaining 70% is this stuff called dark energy, which is accelerating the expansion of the universe. Now, you might say, well, why are you asking why is there so little dark energy? So we, we really don't know what dark energy is. We know what it does, uh, but we know, we know it causes the universe to accelerate, but we have no idea what it is. There have been ideas proposed. Is it the quantum vacuum, right? Is it that energy in the underlying universe that is causing the expansion to accelerate? So we can do the calculation, right? We can use quantum field theory to basically go through and calculate how much energy we expect there to be per cubic meter in the quantum vacuum that's responsible for dark energy. And when we do the calculation, our theory is wrong by a factor of 10 to the 120, right? It mismatches what is observed by this really, really huge factor. So, no, most physicists would just say, right, this prediction is so bad, you just throw this into the bin, right? You just sort of say, right, I need to start somewhere else, but we don't know where else to start. And what people are hoping is that if we can get gravity into the mix, and understand how gravity influences the, the, um, the quantum background, the quantum vacuum, maybe that will explain why there is apparently so little dark energy in the universe compared to what there should be. I'll finish off by pointing out that three of the biggest problems that I think that um, uniting gravity and the other forces will solve, right? And that's the fact that we've got infinities in our, our theories. And infinities are where you divide by zero, and that means that your theory has gone horribly wrong. 
Number one is by what lies at the heart of black holes. Now, I mentioned that in a black hole, that's where matter gets squeezed down. And if you go by Einstein's general theory of relativity, that tells you that that mass gets squeezed down to an infinitesimal point. And so it has infinite density. Now, if you ask Hollywood what's going on inside a, a black hole, they have an answer, right? If you've seen the 1970s film, The Black Hole, or the 1990s film, Event Horizon, black holes are portals into another universe, which often look a lot like hell. Um, but what we actually think is that there's a missing ingredient within our theories, which is quantum mechanics, that would actually prevent this infinite density of mass occurring. But until we can get gravity and quantum mechanics to work together, we do not know what happens at the centers of black holes. The other place where we get infinity is what happened at the start of the universe. Again, if we take Einstein's uh, general theory, and ask what was the density of the universe at time equals zero, it says infinite. And again, we don't really think that there was a true infinity there. We actually think that there's something missing and that something has to be quantum mechanics. In the early universe, it was very dense, it was very hot. And so the other forces would have been as strong as gravity. Whatever it was, it probably wasn't a true infinity. And that would tell us where our universe came from or whether our universe is part of a larger structure, this, this overall sea of universe is known as the multiverse. And of course, the other infinity that we've got is the infinite time ahead. And we want to know whether or not that is the true end of the universe. And there is still a way out of the universe just basically ending as eternal darkness. On immense timescales of around 10 to the 2,000 years, the dark energy of the universe might undergo a quantum transition it might go from one energy level to another energy level, like an electron jumping in an atom, and that might kick off a new Big Bang. That new Big Bang might produce a universe very like our own that might have stars and galaxies or something else in it, or it might end up producing something um, completely different. At the moment, without our theory whereby we can combine gravity with the other forces, these are things that are yet to be solved. And so I'm happy to finish there and take any questions. Thank you.